Hello and welcome to the webinar. My name is Josh McDaniel and I work with the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center. I think you're going to find the presentation that we have scheduled for you today very interesting and also very useful. Alan Ager is going to describe a new program he and his group have been working on called the Landscape Treatment Designer. Before I introduce the speaker though, I want to make a few quick announcements and mostly just point out that the, this is a part of a, a monthly, or actually it's lately been more of a bi-weekly uh, monthly webinar, or webinar series and uh, sponsored by three organizations, and that would be the Joint Fire Science Program, International Association of Wildland Fire, and the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center. So I've got some links up there for you to check out some of the resources that these organizations provide, and all three are producing some great stuff, so please check that out. Um, and now on to today's webinar. Um, I'll introduce the speaker in just a second, but first I want to just let you know how questions work. So if you have a question, type it into the box in your control panel, and depending on what platform you have, it should be named questions or chat. Um, we'll collect all of those questions during the presentation, and then at the end, we'll go through them and have Alan respond to them. Um, also, the webinar is being recorded, so if you want to pass along a link to the recording, that will be posted on the Advances in Fire Practice page oh, about an hour after the webinar. And I've got the link there. Uh, probably easier to get to it by Googling Advances in Fire Practice or, or uh, navigating there through the Wild and Fire Lessons Learn Center website. Okay, so that should take care of the housekeeping, so I'll go ahead and introduce the speaker. Uh, Alan Iger is an Operations Research Analyst at the Forest Service Western Wildland Environmental Threat Assessment Center. He's worked on a wide range of research and management projects since starting with the Forest Service in 1989. And his current research interests include risk analysis, fire ecology, spatial modeling of wildfire, and a variety of other operations research problems related to forest management. And so with that, I will hand it over to Alan and let him take over. Okay. Uh, thanks for attending, everybody. Let's see. Josh, is my screen showing okay? Yep, looks good. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, today uh, I'm going to talk about a program, uh, the Landscape Treatment Designer, or LTD as we call it, that's evolved out of our work on uh, landscape uh, fuel management planning in the last uh, roughly two years. Uh, I'm going to describe the program and uh, show some case studies uh, from some uh, applications at different scales for different problems. Um, the idea behind Hang on a sec here. Let's see. My is it frozen? Screen won't advance. Yeah. Hmm. There we go. Okay. So the idea behind landscape treatment optimization isn't new. There's a, there's a ton of literature, a lot of studies. This is just a smattering of studies in the last roughly five years. Um, uh, the basic idea is that fuel treatments in certain arrangements and types and patterns and amounts on landscape can provide the biggest bang for the buck in terms of achieving some kind of fire management uh, objectives. Um, <clears throat> Despite all these studies, um, there's still a shortage of operational tools that, that people can use to leverage um, the kind of the fundamental idea of spatial treatment optimization. And most of these studies weren't, the, you know, the intent was not to produce a tool for everybody to use. They, uh, in all of the author's defense, they were investigating certain research topics, but it doesn't really matter. And in the end, leveraging some of these principles is, is still quite difficult, despite the fact that there's ample evidence that it works. The one exception being uh, that I know of, uh, globally anyway, is, is Mark Finney's work on field treatment optimization. And Mark uh, uh, developed a concept and then programmed into FLAMAP this TOM model. And I'm sure quite a bit of the audience has, has heard of this. So uh, TOM stands for treatment optimization model. And the basic concept is that you can impede the flow of fire across landscapes by breaking up corridors of fast fuel. And Mark's written several papers on it. It's been used in other 
studies, not the TOM model, but the same idea of disrupting fire spread through landscapes. Uh, the Forest Service uh, implemented this uh, both conceptually and mechanically using uh, Mark's uh, TOM program in FLAMAP as part of the SPOTS and SPLATS and Fire Shed Assessment program. So these uh, diagrams on the bottom, this is uh, two fire ignitions. Uh, these, these figures have been around the block many times. I'll show them again. Uh, that two ignitions uh, unimpeded through some uniform landscape uh, creates a perimeter this large. Random field treatments shown by little black dots do little to impede fire growth. And regular designs and patterns of treatments, not only the arrangement of the treatments, but the dimensions of the treatments can have a dramatic effect on fire spread rate. So uh, this graph showing the fractional landscape treated versus the relative spread rate shows uh, random treatments have little reduction in spread rate, whereas complete overlap uh, has a dramatic effect. And there are diminishing returns after you treat, say, 30 or 40 percent of a landscape. The bang for the buck decreases. So these are really important concepts in uh, landscape field treatment planning. And uh, probably everybody's been exposed to it. And there's empirical evidence from, for instance, uh, studies in rangelands. It's pretty hard to test this on the ground, but um, uh, some of the concepts have been uh, uh, well substantiated by, by controlled fires and, for instance, rangelands. And it uh, has been uh, made operational, as I said before. And it's really the only case that I know of where a spatial uh, optimization approach has been made available to the fuel planning uh, community to actually use in field treatment projects. So this is a screen capture of the TOM interface. And so here are field treatments. And you put in a landscape that's fully treated and one that is not treated, uh, fully treated meaning all potential treatments. And it'll tell you which ones are the best to, to actually implement. OK. so. Uh, there are some fuel management objectives, uh, however, where the reduction in landscape spread is not the primary goal. And a good example is dry forest restoration. So the TOM model is about excluding fire for the protection of fire sensitive values, for instance, WUIs, conservation reserves, infrastructures. So a strategic fragmentation of fuels to reduce spread rate. And treatments can be located proximal to values of concern. In the case of dry forest restoration, which is a significant component of the fuels effort these days, the Forest Service, uh, we are concerned with reintroducing fire into fire adapted forests. And we want to create landscapes where managers can let fires burn and use large scale prescribed fire without consequences. So it's really more of a hazard issue than uh, reducing fire spread. And as we looked more and more at what people were doing, especially in dry forest systems. We found that the concept uh, of uh, uh, dry forest restoration in terms of the spatial context didn't really fit with what the TOM model would try and do to these landscapes. So that led to the concept where we could spatially optimize dry forest restoration. We could use treatments to efficiently build what we uh, termed low hazard fire containers. We could minimize the treated area, maximize the container size, treat stands that exceed some certain fire behavior threshold. So if a natural or planned ignition happened, it could, it could be managed for benefit. Uh, you could also maximize ecological value in the patches. For instance, uh, uh, old growth, fire resilient trees, or other dry forest uh, ecological values. And there are many other spatial planning problems for fuel management. When you look around at what uh, uh, people are doing um, in terms of fuel treatment goals, of what I just talked about were these what we're calling low hazard fire containers, essentially fire resilient, creating these fire resilient patches. Uh, there's you know a lot of work going into focus. Uh, sort of defensible fuel breaks, where the brown areas depicts a wooey and we're treating around it. Uh, dispersed fuel breaks, maybe to uh, to protect dispersed wooies or spotted owl habitat or other kinds of critical habitat or something that you know isn't bulked up on one part of the landscape. Uh, and then there's something that. Uh, We've termed high hazard fire containers, which essentially is an approach where people are 
treating along roads and creating networks of fuel breaks such that, and they're going to let fires burn inside these, but contain it to the perimeter. So they're busting up the landscape in terms of uh, creating a net network of fuel breaks. And so all these are different spatial patterns that range, that, that correspond to or address certain field treatment goals, whether it be restoration protection or, or containment. And there aren't, you know, some clear breaks here. This is just sort of a general uh, 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 taxonomy of, of treatments, and there's gradations in between them too. But uh, just like in any kind of taxonomic problem, you have to you have to call the split somewhere. Okay, so given that we had all these different problems, and we wanted to experiment with their effectiveness in terms of meeting certain goals, we wanted uh, a, a program to uh, tackle this, uh, design these, uh, and experiment with these different field treatment spatial patterns. On another note, tools are also needed for pr just general prioritization or prioritizing fuel management investments at a range of scales. So, uh, for instance, in the Forest Service, we have a national program that allocates money to regions, that allocates money to national forests, that allocates money to ranger districts, that then search around for the best projects, and then go into a mode of designing treatments um, for the landscape. And at each of these junctures, there's an allocation process and a prioritization process that uh, values uh, uh, the investments in fuels in terms of reducing risk. And uh, nationally in the Forest Service, the, we use EMDS and the HIFPAS system at, at this level, but it's pretty scattered as you move down through the through the spatial scales. And so uh, it, it's a slightly different problem, but also lacking uh, tools that could uh, uh, facilitate uh, the whole process of uh, invest, uh, prioritizing investments. Um, so I'm going to talk about both of these. I just wanted to distinguish there's two different problems. There's an investment prioritization among broad landscape or administrative units. Uh, there's also the problem of designing a specific treatment package for a given landscape to address a specific fire goal or fire management goal, field treatment goal. So modeling a spatial planning problem uh, typically uh, involves three components in the operations research world. There are objective functions which quantify the goals. There are constraints which are restrictions on budgets or activities, and then there are thresholds. Uh, limits on acceptable condition in the solution in terms and in, in the fuel modeling world, fire and fuel modeling world, a threshold is an acceptable fire behavior when you've uh, completed a project. Um, so just some simple examples. Uh, for instance, an objective could be to maximize the area stands uh, treated near critical habitat to defend it uh, or to uh, reduce fire severity around critical habitat to uh, uh, facilitate suppression. Constraint, treat 1,000 acres per project. Uh, threshold, uh, treat stands that have an active crown fire behavior. Um, another example, uh, maximize the reduction in risk by some definition of it. Uh, constraint, treat 1,000 acres per project. Threshold, uh, treat stands that have greater than 8-foot flame length and some specific fuel model. Uh, another example, uh, uh, maximize the area of stands treated near roads and natural fire breaks to build some kind of containers, treat some 1,000 acres for a project, um, treat stands that have active crown fire behavior. So, uh, you know, you can use objectives, constraints, and thresholds can uh, consist of a, a variety of variables, different variables. Uh, sometimes it's hard to differentiate between an objective and a constraint. An objective is something that you would like to have. A constraint is something that you have to have. And in the examples I'm going to show, uh, there can be interchanged uh, use the same variables or uh, the variables can be switched around to examine different kinds of problems. So this is what the landscape treatment designer looked like and we thought we could create a very simple program and it used to be simple but it's not so simple anymore but um, it's relatively simple is I think the best way to describe it but it inputs a GIS shape file, a polygon shape file that describes some kind of decision unit. That decision unit can be uh, a stand, it could be a subwatershed, it could be a ranger district, it could be a national forest, it could be uh, any other logical decision unit. And um, so that's identified with some, some stand ID, even though it's not a stand necessarily, with the X and Y uh, centroid coordinate. 
And then fields in the shapefile define the objective function. They can be given weights, and then there's a type that I'll talk about later. Um, then there are constraints. So you can treat until certain constraints are met. In the examples I'm going to show, it's typically an area constraint. We can treat up to a certain area. And then there's treatment thresholds. When do you have to treat a stand? So this is kind of a deterministic approach where we're stating up front that if a stand has a certain fire behavior or a certain condition, could be a fuel loading, uh, these kind of outputs can be derived from, for instance, a flam app run or a behave run, or, or it could just be based on stand characteristics. So you identify the field and whether it's a greater than or less than and some certain value. Then there's two other, excuse me, more complex options. One is aggregate and the other is uh, enable iteration. Aggregate uh, and iteration do two different things. The aggregation connect, uh, creates a connected group of polygon, polygons that within which you've maximized or minimized the objective function. We use a nearest neighbor search. So this is a way we can build project areas. So the program goes around and tries to build project areas starting at every polygon and tries and locates the, the contiguous area within which the objective function is maximized or minimized, however you've uh, specified the problem, without violating the constraints. So it takes up to the constraints. When you iterate, uh, it repeats the prioritization process until all the stands in your landscape have been prioritized into projects. So in each one has uh, successively lower objective function. The number one is uh, maximize the objective, the second one less, and, and so on and so on. So when you do iteration, you can look at, well, how optimum is the solution? How quickly did the objective function degrade as you added, as you identified additional project areas? And then step treatments and constraints, which I didn't show on the previous screen, but that allows you to perform sensitivity analysis. So the program executes the problems problem over and over and over and increases the constraints or increases or decreases the threshold. So you can look at uh, how sensitive is your solution to constraints and particular thresholds. You know, if you could treat 10% more area, could you double the objective function, for instance. And field treatment projects don't ever do much in a way of sensitivity analysis in the classic sense operationally uh, because of the, the difficulty and the lack of sort of automated tools to perform that kind of analysis. Okay, so I'm going to start with a simple example from the Oshko National Forest, and I'm going to do four, four case studies. Uh, one of them is almost published, I hope. None of them are real in the sense that, you know, someone has signed off on some NEPA or something, uh, some other document. So they're all examples of how we think the program uh, can be used, but I just want to emphasize that um, they are uh, uh, examples. So on the Oshko National Forest, uh, they had a problem. They wanted to look at the forest and identify and prioritize future potential project areas, like all national forests do this. And the goal on that forest for a large area was restoration of low-intensity fire. They wanted to use more fires. They wanted to treat uh, areas with a high concentration of overstock stands with large trees and high fuel hazard. The large trees is because they needed to pay for some of the some of the project, and they they did want a, a, a fiber component to the field field treatment project projects. So the input was a stand polygon layer with ratings for the following attributes: one was stocking, the other was structure size class, and the other was a fuel hazard. And they they were in the process of doing this when I stepped into the picture. We didn't create these for what I wanted to do. And so they were kind of tallying up these scores and looking around the landscape. A higher score means it was more de desirable. So for instance, in this case, it's an overstock stand with big trees, gets a two, um, larger uh, in the size structure class. They were looking for uh, uh, multi-story stands. And fuel hazard, they're looking for, for high uh, fuel hazard. And the fuel hazard was determined from a flam map run where they looked at flame length and crown fire potential and classified it as low, medium, and high. So uh, we set the problem up 
by uh, objective function was to maximize the three indices. Uh, we're allowed to treat uh, 8,000 hectares, a lot of land, per project, just an example. And we had to treat any stand that had a flame length greater than two meters, in this case, six, six plus feet, for example. So we ran that in with a non-aggregated run. And it ends up doing, uh, when you don't aggregate, it just essentially ranks all the stands. So these stands are ranked in terms of groups, and each group consists of treating uh, the, the uh, 6,000, 8,000 hectares. And so the red is the highest priority stands, and uh, et cetera. And um, obviously, it's a fairly useless solution because you can't run all over this forest and treat a stand here and treat a stand there. So when you aggregate it, you end up with project areas. So each one of these blobs uh, corresponds to a project where stands were treated up to that treatment threshold, and then uh, th those are reported back. And the order of priority is denoted by the color. And red maximized the objective function compared to all the others, and blue uh, had the lowest objective value. So this is sort of a project priority. Now, if if it was too big or too small or uh, didn't fit the parameters, you can just go back and change your, your treatment allocation. Now, this shows all the stands in each blob. It doesn't differentiate which ones needed treatment, but you can do that. So the program outputs a shape file that shows whether you need to treat or, or not, uh, and also the, pr the priority of the patch. And this fits pretty well with what they uh, what they thought, some of these long stringers are caused by riparian polygons that go on and on forever. The project areas are generally circular in shape because we use a nearest neighbor search algorithm, and that's something we're going to explore uh, modifying in the future. Um, but their highest priority area ended up about where ours was also. So, um, OK, a case study two, and this is just something I'm uh, developing now. It's, it's far from being done. but. Uh, the Willow Whitman Legrand Ranger District wanted to do a fields priority uh, map, and they wanted to create. I'm going to interpret what they what they told me, but uh, essentially create high hazard fire containers, uh, treat along roads and ridges and natural fuel breaks to be able to uh, contain fire. They may let the fire burn until it gets to the edge of the container. They they uh, they might be burning something more than dry forest. It could be you know, mixed fire severity regime, but in any event, they want to be able to stop it. So they want to create this kind of network. This isn't the district, but this shows a network of roads with uh, buffered around, uh, buffers around it. So they want to treat along roads and ridges and treat stands with uh, crown fire behavior or other extreme behavior. So the inputs of the problem were the slope position, valley ridge and side slope, and we used the published algorithm for, for that that uses convexity to determine whether which uh, landform you're on. Crown fire behavior was determined from a FLAMAP model run with land fire data. And we categorized or quantified the percent of each stand that exhibited passive or active crown fire. And then we plugged in distance to road. Data preps, pretty minimal. Didn't, didn't really take that long. So each polygon was attributed with these. And then uh, there are a lot of different ways we could have put set the objective functions and the, and the treatment thresholds uh, up in this problem. But what I did was say, well, I, I want to maximize the slope position because that put me on a ridge top. And I wanted to maximize the stand uh, that I treated. Uh, I wanted to maximize the proportion of the stand that had crown fire and um, or maximize the composition of the stands in the solution that had high crown fire. And I weighted crown fire proportion by 1,000 to scale it close to what slope position is. The weighting is you know, typically, historically, always an issue in these kinds of problems. How do you weight the different objectives in a multi-objective multi problem? And in this case, you know, we experiment with different weights and see what makes the most sense in the solution. And then the treatment thresholds, we forced treatment when the distance to road was closer than 100 meters, and when more than 80% of the crown, or 80% of the stand exhibited crown fire behavior. Remember the land fire data are 30 meters, so we knew fractions of stands that exhibited different kinds of fire behavior. And then we had uh, project areas at two to 3,000 acres. And 
this is far from done, but we got this kind of solution. So these are the project areas, and in this case, I'm showing just the treated stands, but you can sort of gather the outlines of the treatment areas. And they're prioritized from uh, red to blue, uh, same kind of scheme, but the idea is that you can see uh, pick out high priority areas from low priority areas. Um, so the highest priority areas were uh, located on ridges with high concentrations of crown fire stands and near roads. Okay, so and when you zoom in, uh, I need to put this on a DEM to show this slope effects, and it's like I said, it's a work in progress. But you can kind of see how we're uh, aligning these along. Uh, well, you can't really see the roads, but along ridge tops and uh, creating these sort of linear treatment regimes that are resembling uh, a road network that, for instance, uh, you treated around uh, the roads. So that's another spatial problem of trying to create these containers. Now a third one, uh, it's a little more complicated, and it's what started this whole uh, work with this program is that we were trying to do spatial optimization of fuel management activities for dry forests. And this example uh, comes from the Fort Rock Ranger District on the Deschutes National Forest. And, and the idea is that, um, you know, frequent fire is going to uh, sustain and maintain these uh, stands in a, in a low hazard condition. It's going to prevent uh, fire behavior like this. It's from the Davis fire, where understory stands and ladder fields crowned out and killed a lot of old pine trees. And so uh, recurring treatments, uh, uh, mechanical and uh, fire, or just repeated fire are going to keep the stand in the uh, fire resilient condition. So uh, this is actually just the Fort Rock portion of the Bend Fort Rock Ranger District. They split it up. Uh, fire history, a lot of ignitions and fires, existing project map, uh, fire perimeters again, and some pictures of some of the stands. Um, so the treatment goal then so I talked about before, is to create large areas where natural and prescribed fire can be used to sustain old growth ponderosa pine stands, i.e. eliminate hazards. So this is a map of the ponderosa pine old growth in region six is anything over 21 inches. We have an exact definition for it. And this is a density map, so the old growth is kind of concentrated here and over here uh, at the lower elevations. So the way we set up the problem, and this is a look, a bit more complicated. Uh, we modeled every stand in FVS in a treated and untreated condition and ran a wildfire through. And we calculated the resulting or recorded the resulting mortality of old growth ponderosa pine. So we knew what benefit the treatment could have in terms of saving ponderosa pine. So the objective was to allocate treatments to reduce mortality to old growth ponderosa pine from fire. So uh, we had the total uh, treated ponderosa pine uh, objective if the stand was chosen for treatment, and we had the non-treated ponderosa pine if the stand was not selected for treatment. And whether or not it's treated depends on whether the flame length, the expected fire behavior with a uh, run through uh, FVS, FFE, the fire and fuels extension, uh, was used to determine the, the uh, stand level fire behavior, and if the uh, stand exceeded a certain fire behavior threshold, a treatment was required. And if it was treated, it got the treatment objective, which corresponded to the trees, total trees uh, in the treated stand. If it was not treated, it got the total trees in the untreated stand. These are post-wildfire treated and non-treated. So if uh, a stand was treated and a wildfire came and all the treatment saved all the trees, it would be a fairly large value. Um, if it wasn't treated and a wildfire came through, you might have lost it all. So the idea is where can you locate a project area and save the most trees, a contiguous project area, and save the most old growth by doing the treatments. Uh, and we actually ran a battery of uh, different values for uh, constraints and treatment thresholds. It's a bit of a complicated problem. Now, this is iterate until everything is treated. And this is using, a, a, for instance, a 3,000 hectare treatment allowance versus a 7,000 uh, hectare treatment allowance and a four meter treatment threshold. So uh, you know, one question is, how much should you invest 
uh, a little bit in a lot of projects or a lot in a few projects. And there's trade-offs. There's spatial trade-offs and, and uh, other efficiency trade-offs. Obviously, if you have big project areas, there's a higher likelihood that uh, it'll reburn with uh, all else being equal with the natural ignition, and it'll also be cheaper to burn with a large prescribed fire. So uh, the prioritization of the projects, one being the one that maximized the objective, changed when we uh, change the um, amount of investment for reasons I can't uh, don't have time to go into, but these are two different scenarios where we're going to treat um, a lot in each project, uh, and we prioritize the whole area versus we have much smaller projects and running out through time, or in different areas. The intervening areas are where the program can't find any more uh, space to put in another another project. And obviously, these are not exact project boundaries. It just, you know, is a, a indicator of a location to start start working in. The circular shape's a bit unnatural from a planning perspective. So, so, um, so we did a sensitivity analysis, and I promise you, this is the most complicated slide in the presentation. And I'm almost uh, getting close to wrapping up here, but uh, we experiment. Each dot is actually a run with our program, and this is when we can allow treatments from zero up to 3,000 hectare project. So we step it and look at the solution. And this is the post wildfire net ponderosa pine. It's the ponderosa pine left standing after you've treated the stand and you have a wildfire in it. And these different lines are different flame length thresholds. The flame length threshold of one means that well, you treated just about every stand because every stand is going to have a flame length under the conditions we uh, simulated wildfire greater than a, a meter. We assumed a 97 percentile thereabout condition. And so uh, as you increase your treatment allowance, you build a bigger project and you get more ponderosa pine trees. That's great, but you had to treat every stand and you're left with a very small project area in the end. If you have a high flame length threshold, meaning uh, uh, you treat uh, sparsely within the patch because most stands don't exceed the fire behavior threshold, you actually have a net loss of trees uh, after a fire. And that makes sense. Uh, if you don't treat very many of the stands, you've left a lot of stands in a, in a vulnerable condition and the ensuing uh, wildfire, if it happened, would kill a lot of trees. But the interesting thing is there's a net where it's zero and then there's also some sort of sweet spots in the landscape where you can treat sparsely, meaning a high flame length threshold, and still save a lot of trees. So the, this uh, triangle is a seven meter flame length threshold, and you're getting a net benefit. And if you treat a seven meter uh, flame length threshold, in this example, you're not treating that many stands. So it's locating a place in the landscape where there's probably been treatments already, and other factors are mitigating this uh, fire or other uh, factors are mitigating fire severity such that you don't get the mortality. And that's kind of what we're after in terms of optimizing the location of treatments, uh, assuming that uh, uh, preserving old growth ponderosa pine is your main objective in it. Um, so finally, uh, scaling up to forests and regions. So we've experimented with uh, running the program at larger scales. This is an example of all the Huck 6 watersheds in Region 6, where we took their terrestrial, the Region 6 terrestrial assessment that uh, prioritized watersheds for terrestrial restoration, and we blended it with uh, fire uh, risk outputs that were derived from FSIM, FPA uh, uh, simulations. We weighted them equally, and then we uh, asked uh, which watersheds were the highest priority for both wildfire risk mitigation and uh, terrestrial uh, ecological priorities. Uh, just an experiment. Um, and using this process, you could incorporate any of several national uh, watershed, for instance, the watershed condition framework, uh, up terrestrial assessments and wildfire risk assessments in some combination and prioritize individual sub-watersheds or you could do aggregation and develop, for instance, collaborative landscape, forest restoration areas and the like. So this is a shift from field treatment design into the uh, realm of, of trying to prioritize uh, budget allocations at, at much larger levels or scales. So uh, this is the uh, website. Uh, with the program, there's a tutorial that Nicole uh, Bryant put together 
and there's a GTR with the Ochoco example, uh, and there's a an example data set that can be uh, used, and it's pretty easy, of course, to put together a shape file uh, for your own for your own data to uh, experiment with. And that's um, all I have, and I think we've got plenty of time for questions. Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, so if you have a question, go ahead and type it into the questions box there, and we'll read it out and have Alan respond. And we do have some time here, so go ahead and get those questions in. Um, so while we're waiting for those to come in, I'll, I have a couple questions. I, one thing that came to mind, when you were talking about the, there at the end, when you were talking about the, the integrated regional budget allocation function, do you have the same types of functions in the the um, uh, when you're looking at the more of the project level or the forest level, is budget allocation a part of that uh, prioritization <laughs> process there? Well, um, yes, in the sense that uh, national forests uh, allocate money to to districts for field management projects. So, uh, you know, the process happens at each scale and regional efforts uh, transcend those scales by prioritizing or attempting to prioritize down to, for instance, the HUC-6 levels done quite often. Does that answer your question? Well, I mean, in the, like, you know, is it the sort of thing where somebody could play around and say, you know, we have X amount of dollars, and so with that amount of money, where, where would we get the most bang for our buck? type of analysis. Yeah, in terms of wildfire risk versus terrestrial ecology versus watershed condition framework. Okay. Um, exactly. The key question at hand is now that uh, the Forest Service in particular is involved in all these national scale assessments, where do the highest priority uh, highest priorities line up? Align so that you can um, you can address problems from multiple assessments and integrate their prioritization into one solution, uh, which is the purpose of going to an integrated budget allocation system. Okay. So, yes. Okay. Um, Linda Wadley asked a question, and I was sort of asked, was thinking the same, along the same lines, but she says, hello, how do you intend to teach your intended audience to use this model, including the basics they would need? So, you know, if, if, if say, if there was a, a, a unit out there or an individual that was wanting to to get up to speed on this, how long do you think it would take, and are there any prerequisites in terms of GIS skills that are needed, and um, sort of what are the, what, what's needed to get going with this? Well, you need you need to, or someone you work with needs to know how to build an input data set, which consists of a shape file, a uh, polygon file with stands or wa or watersheds attributed with uh, uh, decision or variables that would affect uh, constraints and um, achievement thresholds and objectives. Um, that's sort of the short answer. Uh, um, you know, it's hard without knowing the specific problem you're interested in doing, it's, it's hard to answer that. But at a minimum, you need some GIS skills. Uh, we don't have formal plans for any sort of uh, training program. We do have a pretty nice looking tutorial, uh, thanks to Nicole. And a, and a data set that people can walk through so you can run the entire exercise and, and learn the program that way. Fundamentally, the program, the basic prioritization is pretty simple. You can duplicate some of the functionality in GPS or in GIS if you have the patience for it. So, um, you know, it's one of these things I view as an incremental learning process. Okay. Do you guys provide any support? You know, if people have questions, or just a, sort of a, as you go along, email? No, of. sure. We'll we'll take we'll take support. Our emails are on the website. I mean, we'll we'll do uh, support the program and uh, to to the best we can. And we're interested in more case studies and whether we uh, our vision of the multitude of uses for the program will live up to our expectations. So yeah, sure. Okay. Um, Joel Carson has a couple questions. He asked first is a uh, will the sub Will the software operate on a 64-bit computer or only 32? We can get you a 64-bit version if you want, not a problem. Okay. Um, and yes, it will. It, it, I'm sorry, it's compiled to run on both right now, and it is. Uh, I don't think it's optimized in any way for 64-bit, but it will run. Okay. And Joel, also, uh, 
wants to know if the software can only take one input shape file or if it can take multi multiple. One input shape file. Okay. All right. Um, well, one other question. I know that your group has worked on, um, uh, you're the developer of ArcFuels, and so what's the connection between this and ArcFuels? You know, there's a... So ArcFuels, uh, this program interfaces with ArcFuels by adding to the, uh, to the spatial planning capabilities uh, inside ArcFuels. So in ArcFuels, you can design field treatment layouts uh, simple ones using queries in ArcGIS um, to uh, prioritize or to select stands, essentially select polygons through the uh, through the query system, and um, it's a laborious process and um, isn't one where you can run it iteratively and easily aggregate, and you can't really uh, um, keep track of objectives and constraints very well. And so, uh, so ArcFuels can be used to develop input data sets for this program, and the outputs in this program can be taken back into ArcFuels Arcfuel, to run uh, wildfire behavior models on the solutions to find out what, uh, what the optimal solution provided in terms of risk reduction, for instance. Okay. So this isn't, this is sort of, can be, viewed as a almost a component of arc fuels or is it sort of a stand alone is at, it at the time it, at the time it stands alone but most people would use it in conjunction with arc fuels and it can be executed from the arc fuels menu and it's distributed with arc fuels as well okay okay so okay. they're they're kind of parallel tracks you know we we view this as an extension of arc fuels capabilities it just wasn't developed within it um, uh, because there are a lot of issues, some of the uh, budget allocation and other issues aren't aren't really within the arc fuels realm. Gotcha. Okay. Well, Alan, there's um that's all the questions that are in there. So I guess you answered everybody's questions in your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a it's a bit thick, but uh, if people are interested in the program. We will. Um, uh, we'll support, uh, we, we are interested in additional case studies and, and thinking about these problems in different ways and so if people have interest they could send us an email and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to help people use it. Okay, one, one more came in while we were trying to wrap up. There is a, um, is there a limit, this is from Anna Barros, is there a limitation in terms of extent of the area to analyze? Um, if there is, we haven't found it yet. So we've analyzed uh, 50,000 polygons, for instance, um, and solutions, aggregated and iterative solutions can, you know, can take 10 or 15 minutes to run the very most complex problem that it runs. Uh, so we haven't found it yet. Um, I'm, I, I don't know what the theoretical limit is. It's it's larger than any problem we've given it. Okay. Okay. Well, Alan, we appreciate it. And uh, so, if anybody's interested, they can contact Alan and his group and get some more information on the program. And if you'd like to pass along a, a link to this webinar, we will have it up on Vance and Fire Practice as soon as it I can get it uploaded. It'll take about forty five minutes or an hour. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate it. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for attending.